Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm uh, continuing on with the with the test here, and I had gotten to overall shape, and also to uh, the shape of the atom. So we've done up to that point. So let's look at bond angles, and we're asked here about the bond angle in ASCL five. So we've been going through the different bond angles. And this, this is often a bit annoying to people because they think they have to memorize a whole lot of stuff. I don't think that that's entirely true, but let's do a little bit of summary of the bond angles. So this is linear and you can see that's going to be 180. That's pretty clear that it's 180. Then we've got the, let's see, trigonal. That one's not too bad either because that's a circle split into three. So it's 120 degrees. The, I will admit the tetrahedral is a little bit more of a challenge. Now, when I do these dash lines and wedge lines, what I'm trying to do is represent three dimensionality and what I'm doing here is um, saying that the wedge lines are kind of going back into the page. The, sorry, the dash line is going back into the page. The wedge line is coming out of the page. So that's a three dimensional situation. That's 109.5 degrees. I can't really give you a good reason for that because it is in three dimensions and it is a bit harder to represent uh, a reason for that. With the trigonal bipyramidal, the one with five. We've got a couple of things going on. We've got 90 degrees here for this bond angle. We've got 180 for this one, which I suppose is optional really, because it's really just two 90s. And the other one we have is 120. So if you remember the trigonal bipyramidal is more a combination of the linear and the trigonal. So you've got the linear going through the vertical here, and then you've got the trigonal in the horizontal plane here. And those are the, those are reflective of those bond angles. <laughs> yes, you do have to memorize these if you are not, if you're not very happy with the, the way that they're represented I mean, sometimes people just don't like geometry and don't see the bond angles. And the last one, they're all 90s all the way around. That's for the octahedral. So all of those are 90 degrees. So for this one, ASCL5, you would have to figure out what its overall shape is and then you can uh, then you can determine the bond angles that are present. So uh, before I go on with that, let me, let me do a quick poll here and I'll see how people feel about the bond angles. 
generally people don't feel that great about them, I must admit. Okay, spond angles, how do you feel about them? So what would be the answer if it was asking for oh. a, oh, sorry. I haven't done this question yet. I just want to see how people felt about bond angles in general. Okay, sorry. That's all right, but I will, I will answer this question in a second. Okay, one more. All right, I'm gonna end the poll here. All right, so it's about half and half here. Can anybody ask me a question here about bond angles? Is it just a, is it just a feeling that geometry sucks? Or is it that um, it's hard? I don't know. Do you not count that last A right there? Or AS, whatever. Did I not count that last A? The one with the, with the thick um, black line. The one with the thick black line. No, I did. I did. It's still 90 degrees. It's just coming out of the page, Coden. Oh. Is it like, it's not, it's supposed to be 3D, right? Yeah. Okay, I see. That, that's where I was going wrong. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody have any other questions about bond angles? I mean, half of you understand it halfway, so you know there must be some some kind of thing that you could ask me about this. So how do we get one hundred nine point five degrees? You can't. I mean, not. I, I can't tell you how to how to get it on on from a two dimensional diagram because it's a three dimensional structure, Michael. Uh, okay. That one, I guess you will have to just remember because I, I can't give you a, the other ones I, you can sort of see, right? All the other ones, but not this one. This one's a little bit tougher because it is a three dimensional shape and it's very much more difficult to express why that is 109.5. All right, thanks. All right, any other questions? Okay, so going back to ASCL5, the valence electrons for ASCL5 are going to be five plus five times seven, which is 40. Remember AS is in group five, CL is in group seven, and there's five of those chlorines. So we've got 40 there. So I'll put, put in my, my chlorines. Now I'm not interested too much in the shape right now because I'm just doing the, just doing the Lewis dot structure now I fix up all the chlorines first by putting another six around them in addition to the bond I've already got. And you can see I've already used up 40, 40 bounce electrons. So that would be the completed Lewis dot structure. So as you can see, the overall shape here is trigonal bipyramidal because there's five. And if you wanted proof of that, you could always go back up to the diagram for trigonal bipyramidal, which is up here, because that's what that's the shape it would take on with five, five groupings. And yeah, then, then you can see that it would be um, 120 and 90 would be the answers for that because it's because it is a uh, a trigonal bipyramidal shape. I can find it here. Here we go. 120, 90. That's what I would put down. All right. Does anybody have any questions? So we can just look and see, like, if there's five of the, if there's five of the anion, then it'll always be 120, 90. Or are there some situations yeah. where? No, it will. Oh. It'll always be. If it was linear, it'd be 180, right? If it was if it was trigonal, it'd be 120. If it was tetrahedral, it'd be 109.5. If it was uh, if it was trigonal by it'd be 120 degrees and 90 degrees. 90 degrees by itself is not really an answer per se. 180 degrees, 90 degrees is a better answer. For octahedral. Although I'm looking at that, I. So how do we get the bond angle? Is it the same for like? Well, that's the thing. You have to. Well, Olivia, this is the issue. You have to be able to. Yeah, you have to be able to visualize it. 
you know, that's the thing. I mean, oh, there's not going to be a picture. We just kind of. Well, like... no, there very is. There's a picture. There's pictures up here. Oh, okay. So there's your, there's your linear. I don't know. Can you, 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 can you see the bond angles on those? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. I mean, that's the main thing. Being, being able to realize, you know what 90 degrees looks like. So, you know, that that's more than 90, for example, right. it makes it. So it is it uh, like the same angle to like each atom? Yes. Or is it just... Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Unless it's uh, unless it's trigonal by pyramidal, in which case you know they, they do differ a bit. You've got the nineties and the one twenties, depending on what you're talking about. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, I suspect for the octahedral, either 90 or 180 degrees and, and, or 90 is, are going to be acceptable answers. So uh, if they're not, then, you know, please, you can email me about that. If you believe you've been slighted, that would be fine. Does anybody have any, any does anybody have any other questions about bond angles? Okay. Oh, sorry. Is there yeah. just a place we can see this written down or should we just write that down real quick? For the oh, you mean for the for the bond angles? Yeah, they're in the power. Yeah. It's in the PowerPoint, oh. which I haven't opened yet, but it's in the PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you. So no, you don't need to. Uh, no, you shouldn't need to write that down. But remember, you you'll you can always have access to this recording as well, Joseph. But uh, yeah, I'll show you in a second where it is in the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Let's continue on with these. The hybridization. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I, I spent a bunch of time on this last time in the last class. So I'm not even really going to poll this. All I'm going to say is that each of these has a relationship to each overall shape. So the SP is the linear, the SP2 is the trigonal, the SP3 is tetrahedral, the SP3D is trigonal by pyramidal and the sp3d2 is the octahedral so when you go ahead and you do the the valence uh, the valence electrons for this and you come up with the lewis dot structure and you come up with the lewis dot structure and i'll do it for tei4 the valence electrons for TEI4 are going to be, I think, no, not five. Is it six? Six plus, um, let's see, four times seven. There we go. That's 34. So uh, we do the, the TE, we put all the eyes around it. Yeah, whether you understand this or not is going to be really dependent on if you were here on last Wednesday or not. Because if you won't, you'll be completely utterly lost when I talk about this hybridization stuff. So that would be 32, and then we've got two more, that'll be 34. So you can see the TEI4 has five groups, which means we need five hybrids. Which means we're going to be going with SP3D as our, as our, uh, as our hybridization. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not even gonna do a poll on this because it's gonna really depend if you were here on Wednesday or not. Any questions? But if you have questions and you were here on Wednesday, then you know I can try and answer them. But in the end, the, the hybridization is going to be based always on the overall shape. Always on the overall shape. How many, how many total groups there are? atoms and lone pairs. Okay. All right, 
and in what direction does the dipole in O, S, B point? So what we're looking at here is if we've got O and S, B, we go back up to the periodic table and we look at how close each one is to fluorine. The one that's closest to fluorine will be more electronegative. And out of those two, O is more close to fluorine than S, B is. So when you're answering a question like this, don't worry so much about the double bond, but we get a delta minus on the O, a delta plus on the SB, which means the dipole will run from the SB to the O, always to the one that's more electronegative. So the answer would be, be left in this case. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? All right, dare I ask, let's see, how do you feel about dipoles? Dipoles on single, single atoms like this or single bonds. How do you feel about it? Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So does, uh, does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Now consider the compound below and we're looking for the net dipole in this case. Okay, so you are given the entire diagram here. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at that, the entire diagram. And again, you know, how, how much you get of this is really going to be dependent on how well you understood this when I went through it on Wednesday. So this, this business here is, a, is simply my representation of a non-bonding electron pair or lone pair. So remember the 3D situation here. So. This is already geometrically set up, which is kind of lucky for you because you know you don't have to, to draw the diagram first or anything. So then you set up the dipoles. You do one along each bond following the same rule I just said. So out of F and GE, the one that's closer to F is of course F. So we're going to have dipoles that run, let's draw a straighter one than that. We're going to have dipoles that run parallel to the bonds, but towards the fluorine. And then we'll do it for that one. Now, remember, you can only do it along bonds. So the non-bonding electron pair doesn't get one. So what you're seeing here is the fact that these two dipoles here, they're opposite. So they're going to cancel. And then you've got these two here they are going to point in this direction here. So the net dipole is going to be this one, which is going to be west. That would be your answer. And dare I ask how people feel about this one? I don't think people will feel too good about it, but we'll see. All right, how do you feel about net dipoles? This net dipole question. Yeah, I knew that there'd be some people who didn't understand it at all. I get that. Yeah, yeah, all right. All right. Okay, questions? Questions? So, so how would it be like on the east? What do you Direction? mean? Like well, how would it... What, what do you mean? If, I mean, if it was the opposite way, I mean, if this was the mirror image, it, it would be pointing east. Oh, okay. So, is, but how do we get it though? That's the question. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not understanding your question, Michael. What's your, uh, what, like, what, what exactly are you asking? About like, the, um, I guess like the double bonds. I, I'm, not, I'm not understanding your question, Michael. Can you, can you be more clear about it, please? Uh, I think he's asking, and just stop if I'm wrong, is how do you determine that it's east based on the diagram? 
Okay. Well, the these these GEF bonds are in the same plane. I mean, they're in the horizontal plane. This one points into the page. This one points out of the page. And then you've got two dipoles here that are pointing in the same general direction. And their net dipole is going to point in that same general direction, but directly in between the two. So that, that's how I'm getting that. That's the, that's the net dipole there. Thank you. So what I can tell you is that when you've got this situation, the net is going to be in this direction. Right, and I'll circle that. Uh, and when you've got this situation, the net will be in the direction we just came up with, right, between the two. But when you've got this situation, I can't remember if I went into this or had time to go into it last time. Um, when they're opposite like that, they cancel out. When they're going in the opposite direction, they're the same size, but they're going in the opposite direction. Then they cancel out. I mean, if you think about it, you add them together, what you're getting is, it's like, it's like me riding up to uh, say, say clear water, getting to clear water and then coming back and going back to the same place. And that means they cancel out. No, I haven't gone anywhere, basically. Think of it, think of it like that. And you can see that's why these two, that's why these two linear ones cancelled. But in, in general, that's how you're going to that's how you're going to look at it. Does anybody have any questions about that? I, I don't know if that clears it up for anybody. Yeah, what? thank you so much. All right. What are the two dots? Are those but, just You've got to you've got to consider that to be a non-bonding electron pair. Okay. Okay, Coden. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have any other questions about that? Okay. Any other questions? All right, let, let's see how you feel about it now. If you feel any better about it, as you can see, not many people felt good about it now at that point. Let's see, any better? How, do we look, how are we looking with it? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot better now. There's still, there's, there's still some people who, who are kind of halfway understanding it. Is, is there anything any other questions I can answer about this? What is like the the dotted part on the the left for the mm -hmm. point? Why doesn't it get a dipole? Yeah, because it's not a bond. You can only have a bond if there's two atoms, and you know, then one then it has to go to the most electronegative atom. But if you've got an electron pair there, there's no atom to kind of go towards, so it, it doesn't represent anything. It just it doesn't get a dipole. Does that does anybody have any? Is that okay? Do you have any questions yeah. about that? Okay. I'll tell you one other situation here related to this. So let's say we had the situation where it was trigonal and we had one, one going on each side like this. Well, what would happen then is that these two would add up to give this one but this one is the opposite direction to this one. So they'd cancel out. So that would end up being zero. So what I can tell you is that if in, in all cases, when there's all atoms, the dipole is zero. So the dipole is gonna be zero for this one, for linear, for the trigonal planar, for the tetrahedral, for the trigonal bipyramidal, and the octahedral. So when there's all atoms present, only atoms, then the dipole is always zero. 
they always cancel out. And that's just, just an example of how that happens here too. So that can be helpful as well to know that. Does uh, anybody have any other questions about this? Okay. So when we do the review, I'll spend some more time on it and uh, we'll do some more examples then. In the meantime, I'd really like you to watch my video again, if you haven't already done so, that's, that's, uh, that's about dipoles. I think it's well worth it. It's because it really helps you visualize the dipoles and, and how, to, um, how to add them together and everything. I really, really, really suggest that you watch that video. Even if you don't watch any of the others, watch that one. All right, any other questions? Okay. So I said I was going to, I'm gonna submit this so we can leave this page here. Joseph, was you asking about the, the bond angles? Yes, yes, it was. Yeah, there, there you go. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, there's some notes here about dipoles, but uh, the, the video is the better in hybridization, but the videos for that are better than the in these notes because it helps with the visualization. Okay, so we're going to enter into a, a place here that many of you aren't going to like, but uh, we have to go there anyway. And this is into the realm of molecular orbitals. So these are the, uh, the, the these are combinations of atomic orbitals. And what we're looking at here is what happens when we take the electrons from atomic orbitals and we combine them together to give compounds. So let's uh, take this take this one step at a time. Uh, just like my psychiatrist told me, I, I'm afraid, I was afraid of stairs and, and uh, he said, take it one step at a time. That's what we're going to do here. So let's say we're looking at this bond here specifically between two hydrogen atoms. We know that if we have a hydrogen atom, it has a 1s orbital and we have another hydrogen atom that is a 1s orbital as well. And what happens is that we're going to look at what happens when we combine these electrons together to form what we call a molecular orbital, which is the combination of these, of these two electrons. Now, since we've got two electrons here, we can put them down here. We put one in the, one going up and one going down, but they both have to go in the bottom. We're still following the same rules here as we always were about filling orbitals. And that is we always start at the bottom and, and work our way up because energy is always going this way. Let's look at some, some diagrams here. I'm going to have to open the site that I used to, I used to use here is based on flash and I don't think it works anymore. So I have a video though, where I think I went through this. So I'm going to open that video. I can change the share on this as well. Share sound, share. All right, let's see, mini lectures. And we're looking at molecular orbitals part one. 
So I'm going to play this video because it's probably the best explanation I can give anyway. Show you how to fill in electrons on a molecular orbital energy diagram. And we're going to use O2 as an example. And the first thing we want to do is we want to put electrons on each side here. Mm, for maybe that's not what I want. Hang on. Let me see if I can find. No, that's probably not what I really want. Let me see if I've got something different here. I thought I had actually gone through this. Let me let me see if I can come up with a better a diagram here. Oh, here we go. The molecular orbital interaction. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. okay. Combination would be um, shown on paper. So let's say we've got two one s orbitals, and we've we're going to assign them the let's same. Let's see if I can find. Here we go. Here. If we combine them together, we'll have a positive and a positive 1s, and we combine them and we get this sigma 1s, and that's a bonding orbital. And you can see that everything is all in the same molecular orbital down here. That's what's happening at this point here. All right. So what I'm showing you here, it's not, it's not the greatest diagram. I was hoping I would have shown this on the uh, on that other website in the, in the video, but this is a decent enough uh, representation of what's going on. So a 1s orbital is spherical. So there's two spherical orbitals here. Along with that, they also have a phase associated with them. Uh, and then one, one is, you can call them both plus, if you will. And if you get two of these 1s orbitals of the same phase combining, what we end up with is what's called a sigma molecular orbital. And this is going to be what happens when we combine the atoms of two 1s orbitals together like this, and we end up getting the sigma 1s orbital. The other possible way that we could combine these is if we had one that was a plus phase and one that was a minus phase. So these are opposite phase, and that situation is what we call antibonding. And in the antibonding situation, we call that sigma 1s star. And that is the opposite of bonding. So it's, uh, it's evil, if you will, it's very high energy. And in the case of hydrogen, you'll notice we don't have any electrons in the antibonding orbital. We only end up having two electrons and they get both put into what we call the bonding orbital. So we call that the sigma, the sigma 1s orbital. This is called the sigma 1s star orbital. Give me a second here to, to kind of explain this and hopefully you'll understand it once I show you what happens when we do helium. But if we did helium, you know that helium and helium doesn't bond together, it's a noble gas. Well, you're going to see why that is here on the basis of the molecular orbitals. So it's still the same arrangement with the orbital diagram here. So remember the molecule when they join together is in the middle. So we have HE, we have HE. And remember HE is 1s2, so it's two electrons, and then two electrons over here as well for the other HE, 1s2. And then we put the electrons in here, we've got four of them to deal with now, and we end up putting we end up putting one uh, with two into the bottom here and then two into the top. So this is going to be the antibonding where we've got two electrons and then we've got the bonding which has one electron. Oh, sorry, uh, bonding which has also has two electrons down here. So with that, we can calculate what, what is called bond order. Now bond order is going to be bonding electrons minus antibonding electrons divided by two which is going to be two minus zero divided by two, which is one. What that means is we're going to have a, or we're predicted to have a single bond between H and H because of that. Now the, the counting up of the bonding, this is the bonding electron here, there's two of them, and there's no none in, in the antibonding here. So the antibondings are always on top and the bondings are always on the bottom. Does anybody have any questions so far?
All right. Just for a laugh. How do you feel about this topic so far? I dare not ask, but uh, let's see how we feel about it so far. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, at least nobody says I don't understand it all. That's that's uh, that's positive. But yeah, it's a this is a bit of a tough topic. Can, can it? Can anybody ask any questions at this point? What about the? What about the counting of bonding electrons and anti-bonding electrons? How do you feel about that? Does anybody have any questions about that? Because that's that's not a difficult. That shouldn't be a difficult concept. All right, let's look at the bond order on the on the helium helium. You'll see that the bond order is this. The bond order is two minus two divided by two, which is zero. So what that would indicate is that there's no bond between the two helium atoms. And we know that's true anyway, because the helium atoms don't bond to each other. But the reason for that is because we've got two electrons in the anti-bonding orbital as well. So that's the difference between the hydrogen and the helium. So the main thing I'm trying to get at here is that when you take two S orbitals and you combine them together and they have the same phase as I have here, we end up with a molecular orbital here. So what does this represent? In the case of the atomic orbitals, we're seeing what the electrons look like around each of the individual hydrogen atoms. But importantly, with the molecular orbital, what we're seeing is where we expect to find those electrons once the two atoms have bonded. So where are those two atoms? There's one here and one here. Each of these, each of these represents a hydrogen nucleus. So the nuclei are at these points right here. Okay. How do we feel now? And do we feel any better about this? How do you feel now? Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so people are feeling a little bit better about it. That's that's good. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions at all? Let me see if I've got something to do with the hydrogens here. Okay. All right. It becomes a little bit more complicated once we start looking at the, the P orbitals, doesn't it? I know it, it seems, it does look really complicated, doesn't it? That looks awful. My gosh. All right. Let's break this down a bit. So with the p orbitals, you've got to remember that there's three of those, and they have we have one one of each that runs along each axis. We have the x, y, and the z axes over here. Because we've got three orbitals, and we've got three orbitals on each side here, because we're talking about two atoms, of course. Then what's going to happen is that we're going to have a possible six ways of combining them, three bonding, three antibonding. Because we've got the possibility of combining the two PXs together, the two PZs together, the two PYs together. We can combine them with the phases matching and we can combine them with the phases not matching. If the phases match, we get a bond. If the phases don't match, then we don't get a bond. So I'm going to play this video here and hopefully you'll get an appreciation for what I mean by the combination of these P orbitals. Does anybody have any questions before I start the video about what I'm talking about here with the P orbitals? 
All right, let me see how many, I, I, I need to see how many people completely lost with this so far. You don't have to understand it completely at this point. I just want you to, I just want to see if you've, if you're, if you've got some sort of, some modicum of understanding of what's going on. Okay. So yeah, that's that's actually not as bad as I as I thought. I thought there would be people who don't understand it all, and that that would have been because you that you didn't know what a p orbital was. At least at least I, I'm getting some indication that people know what p orbitals are, and that uh, we're looking at combinations for these p orbitals. All right, so I'm going to start the video here. And you can see this in three dimensions. Can combine now. The only kinds of orbitals that can combine are the ones that will allow for overlapping orbitals. So what I'm saying here is that. A PX can combine with a PX, a PY can combine with a PY, and a PZ can combine with a PZ because we can get these orbitals to overlap because they're in the same area of space. What we can't do is we can't get a PY to combine with a PZ. That's because the orbitals for the PY Doing lie, my along thing, the kick y back the the thing. lie along the Z. Uh, sorry, Tyler, what was that? Oh, oh. sorry. Oh, okay. uh, someone asked me a question. Oh, okay. Hot mic, Tyler. Hot mic. Yeah, right. And if you try and put them together, they will never overlap. So only like orbitals will have any chance of overlapping to begin with. So first of all, let's talk about what happens if we combine the two orbitals that I've designated PXs. So this would be down here. All right, so what we're looking at are the two px orbitals combining together. Let me show you again on the diagram so you can see what I'm talking about. We're taking this orbital and this orbital, and we're combining them together, and this will create a bonding orbital. And you can see there's the bonding orbital right there. So this would be like minus, plus, plus, minus, and we combine them together. The two pluses can combine, and we get our nice bonding orbital. Looks kind of similar to the sigma bond we got from the combination of the two 1s orbitals. Now, if we go ahead and we change this now and look at the anti bonding situation, this would be where we've got unlike phases here, this would be like plus and this would be like minus, so this would be minus, plus, minus, plus. And when we try and combine those together, because the phases don't have the same sign, they won't combine and we'll get an anti-bonding situation. Going back to our diagram, you can see that that's the situation we're going to have here. So this would be the combination of the two px orbitals that I've got here. I'm calling that sigma 2px. And this up here would be called sigma star 2px. And what I'm trying to denote there is that this is bonding and this would be anti-bonding. All right. How do people feel about the combination of bonding and anti-bonding for the px orbitals? How do you feel about the bonding and anti bonding combinations? Okay, not so great. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So yes, yeah, not not so great on that one. I do have a don't understand at all here as well. So, uh, can any questions? Any questions that could help here? I mean, I, I'm honestly, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not playing dumb here. I don't know. I don't know what. I'm trying to figure out what you don't understand. I know it's hard. I get that. I know it's it's not. It's something you've never seen before. I get that too. But I just need to. I need to see what it is you're not understanding. Yeah, Professor, why is there anti-bonding in the px orbital? Why is there anti-bonding? Well, it's because if we take the px here and see how I've got minus plus over here and then plus minus over here, if I switch this and make it minus and plus, that's going to result in the anti-bonding. 
So the antibonding is always the opposite of the bonding. It's the, it's the higher energy uh, combination of the two that doesn't lead to a bond. In fact, it leads to what's called an antibond. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions about this so far? Anything that could help with your understanding, please. I, I don't think there's really, there, there might be one person possibly who's in the situation where they couldn't even ask a question that would help their understanding. But everybody who understands halfway or at least claims to must have at least an understanding that would allow them to ask a question that would allow them to understand better. There's only one person who, who may not be able to do that. As for the rest of you, any questions? Can we just go through like another example? Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue. All right. And you can see that that's because we're using a different phase here or trying to combine different phases. All right, let's take a look at the other combinations, my PY and my, my PZ combinations. And what we're going to see here is when these combine, they're going to form a different kind of bond. Now, look at the PXs. You can see that this is going to be an end-to-end -end type combination. This here is going to be a side-by-side -side combination. And this one here is going to be a side-by-side -side combination as well. Let me show you what I mean by looking at the PZs. Now, in, in this diagram, they're designated as something else, but um, just pretend that these are the PZ ones that I'm talking about. And this is what we're looking at. This is called a pi bond. So this is a side-by-side -side interaction now where we're getting the top and the bottoms to both interact, and this forms one single bond where the electron density lies above and below the plane of the bond. That's what we're looking at. So let me go back to the orbital diagram. You can see what I'm talking about. Here's the PZ and here's the other PZ. And when they combine together, this is what we get. We get a bonding orbital between these two PZs that lies in between the z-axes, both above and below the plane of the bond. Let's take a look at what the anti-bonding situation looks like for that one. And that's this one here. And you can see that that's because we're using unlike phases, and when we try and combine them, we get the anti-bonding pi orbital. All right, so let's see what the designations would look like for that. This one here would be called pi 2pz, and this one here would be called pi star 2pz. So this one is from the combination of like phases and this one is from the combination of unlike phases. All right, let's take a look at the last. All right, I don't know if I should even ask. How, how do you feel about that? Now, well, before I ask how you feel about it, does anybody have any questions before I, before I get into it? Any questions so far about the PZs? Okay. Let's see how you feel about the PZs. How do you feel about the PZs? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Whoa. All right. Okay. Any questions? I mean, come on, there's a lot of people who, who don't, who halfway understand. One person who doesn't understand anything here. There must, there must be questions here. All right. One now. And you can see this will be my uh, my Y. And it's difficult to see, but the red is behind here. And we're looking at this from the side. So this would be the combinations of, of blues. And behind it, we've got the combinations of the reds. So we're getting the same kind of bonds. It's just difficult to tell because we're looking at it straight on. You can see here as well that this would be the blues. And behind it would be the combination of the reds. 
So it's uh, let's take a look at the uh, the anti bonding on this one. It's a little bit easier to see. And again, you can see that you've got the blues trying to combine with the reds and they can't. The red trying to combine with the blue and it can't. So we don't get a pi bond out of this. We just get an anti bonding type situation out of that one. All right. So on paper, it looks like this. You've got the pi bond between the two y axes and you've got the minus phase joined up here and the plus phase is joined down here so that would be from combination of this plus phase with this plus phase and this minus phase with this minus phase and then when we try and combine them oppositely we get the uh, the anti-bonding type situation over here alright so the designation for that would be pi 2PY for the bonding and pi 2PY and a star for the anti-bonding. Alright, so we've got all the bondings down the bottom there of lower energy and then you've got all the anti-bondings in there of higher energy. So the bondings are all about like phases joining together and the anti-bondings are all about the unlike phases joining together. If you want better pictures of those diagrams, you can see them in the PowerPoint notes, and I'm going to go and uh, show you those. Okay. Um, any questions? Any questions so far about this? All right. Let's take a look at how this looks in the PowerPoint notes. All right. Um, yeah, let's look at the we'll look at the pictures first. All right. So these are all the bonding and anti-bonding combinations of two s and two p orbitals. So when we look at the the s bonding, and we've got the same phase, you can see what we get. We get a a combination looks like an oval. So remember, this is two hydrogen atoms, one at each, one at each. Uh, origin here of the XYZ coordinate system. You can see here it is there. So this is my XYZ coordinate system where I've got the X sort of in the same plane, the Y going into the page, the Z coming up and down. So this is the, the 2S combination that we're talking about. The 2S antibonding combination, you can see they don't bond at all because we've got a plus in here and a minus in the other one. For the two PZ bonding, remembering that Z I've designated as being straight up and down, we take two PZ orbitals, we combine them together, we get these two ovals. This is called a pi bond because it's above and below the plane of the, the bond that lies in between these two nuclei. And then the antibonding, you can see, is the opposite where we've got opposite phases and we have the plus and the minus not interacting and the plus and the minus not interacting over here. And we call that the pi z star antibonding orbital. The PYs both run along the y axis. You can see that the molecular orbitals again form along the y axis as well. And we've got the pluses and the minuses combining together to give these ovals. And then we've got the, the PYs here, which form in the same plane as well. And the plus and the minus, and plus and the minus, so those are opposite. So we end up getting an antibonding there. That's the pi y star antibonding orbital. Now the PX is a sigma bond because it's the combination of the ends here. We don't get this combination of two parallel orbitals, we get a combination of an end-to-end -end situation of the orbitals. We end up getting a sigma bond that looks like this. And the anti-bond is the one where we try and combine them so that we have the plus and the minuses opposite each other. So these are all the different possible combinations that you'll see here for all of these different orbitals. All right. Um, Let's look at, let me look at the, let me look at the, the test here and you'll see 
actually the, the test isn't as bad as it looks because I'm kind of hamstrung a little bit because I can't make you draw anything. You know, I have to make you do it by multiple choice, which means that you can kind of, I don't know, kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word cheat. It's not really cheating per se. It's just that you, you can probably get through it without really understanding it, I guess is the, is the problem but I don't really know how else to present it. So this is the, this is the kind of question. It, so it's multiple choice and it asks, for example, uh, which, best, which best describes the following 2S bonding orbital. And you'd have to find which, which one of these, this will be it by the way, but uh, you'd have to figure out which one of these was actually the one that would, that would fit that. So it does make it a bit easy, easier for you because you know it's not that hard really to, to figure that out. All right, does anybody have any questions? No, right. how do you how do you feel about this? Especially now that you've seen the, the test question. How do you feel about it? Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, it's kind of what I was expecting. Does anybody have any questions that they could they could ask about this? Okay. Now this this here, this is the image you've given. Right. I mean, you, you don't have to memorize any of this. This is actually given to you. It actually shows you the, the bonding and anti-bonding uh, places of the 1S, the 2S and the 2P orbitals there. And to, to, do, to, do the, to do the next part, what you need to be able to do is be able to count bonding and anti-bonding electrons once you've filled in this diagram. So this diagram, you don't have to memorize, you're given it as part of the test. So I'm just going to re, I'm going to redraw it over here. You'll see it's actually not that difficult. So you got 1S, we got 1S, and then we'll have the 2S, which is going to be the same situation. And then we've got the 2P. And then we've got the, the combinations of each of those. All right, so let's say we had, let's say we had O2 and this is how we'd fill it up. Now O, if you'll remember, has eight electrons and it's going to have the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. How do we feel so far about the electron configuration for oxygen? If you don't understand this, we won't be able to go any further. So how do we feel, whoops. How do we feel about the, how do we feel about the oxygen electron configuration? Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, most, most people seem to get that. Does it aim do anybody have any questions? Okay, so now we can put the electrons in. One, two for the 1s2, three, four for the 2s2, and then four in the p orbitals. And remember the rule that we do one in each one, and then the other electron goes in one of the other 
orbitals. So this is something we did back in test three as well when we were doing electron configurations. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. Okay. Doesn't matter where that last electron goes. Okay, any questions so far? So we've got eight total electrons on this side. We've got eight electrons on this side as well. So in the middle, we're going to have the combination of the eight and the eight, which is a total of 16 electrons. So we have 16 total electrons we have to put in these molecular orbitals here, which is just going to be the combination of the eight and the eight. So here's how we fill this. One, two, we always fill from the bottom to the top. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Remember we've got 16 to put in. 11, now look where the next one goes. It goes here because they're the same energy, which means they have to go one in each. That's Hund's rule, if you'll remember. Um, 13, 14, 15, 16. So that would be the final, that'll be the final electron configuration for O2. So that's O, O, and this will be O2. All right, let's see how you feel about this so far. How do you feel just about putting in the electrons? That's all I'm asking here. How do you feel about putting in the electrons? How do you feel about putting in the electrons? How do you feel about putting in the electrons? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so most people seem to understand that, which is good. Any questions? So why do we put it from bottom to top? Because its energy goes this way, Michael, where I've got the arrow. And we always start at the lowest, which is the bottom energy, right? The lowest energy, and we work our way to the top. That's called the Aufbau principle. And it's how we always fill electron diagrams. We always start at the lowest energy and work our way up. Thanks. Okay. And the other thing you've got to understand, of course, is that there's going to be two electrons per orbital. Right, but when they're the same energy, we have to do them one at a time. That's Hund's rule. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, so when we look at the diagram, this is, remember this diagram you're given here, you'll see that there's two kinds of orbitals. You've got the, the ones without the stars, they're the bonding ones, they're the lower energy ones. Then you've got the ones that have the stars, they're the higher energy or the anti-bonding ones. So if you were asked in the case of o, of o, how many bonding electrons there are, you should be able to count them. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, gonna, I'm going to go ahead and, and arrow them here. That's, actually I'll just put them in. That's two, 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 two and two. And the total number of bonding electrons in the O2 molecule would be 10. Let's count the antibonding. Let's count the antibonding. In the antibonding, we've got two, two, and two. That's a total of six in the antibonding. So 10 bonding and six antibonding. All right. Let's see if you caught that or not. All right. How do you feel about 10 bonding and six antibonding? Especially given you have the diagram right there, you can tell, you can tell what's bonding and what's antibonding. Five, four, three, two, one. get some people to vote this time. Okay. All right, questions. Did, now this is really important. I want you to be able to count bonding and anti-bonding electrons. 
Come on, spit it out. If you've got a question, spit it out. This shouldn't be that hard, counting bonding and antibonding electrons. If you know what the bonding ones are and what the antibonding ones are. Remember the bonding ones, the ones without the star, the ones with the star are the antibondings. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So the bond order here is again the bonding electrons minus the anti-bonding electrons divided by two, which would be 10 minus six over two, which is two. So what we expect is a double bond between the two oxygens, which is pretty much what we get anyway. If you did a Lewis structure, that's what you'd come up with. So yeah, there would be a double bond. And that's borne out by the by the formula here as well. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, remember you have this diagram in front of you, so there's no there's no need to memorize anything. It's right there. You just have to know how to fill the diagram. That's all. That's all you have to do. You just have to know how to fill it. I don't think it's that bad. Any questions? There were there were some of you who halfway understood, so I want to I want to see if, if you have any questions that would help. Okay. So you can follow that to to do this for pretty much anything. And for bond order, you can see it's going to be. You could, you could be asked here how many electrons are in bonding or anti-bonding orbitals. And here, the uh, what the bond order is. And the bond order is going to be based on this formula that I'm showing you here, bonding minus anti-bonding divided by two. So if you can figure out both of those, you can get the bond order. The two, here, two there is because there's two electrons in one bond, so that's why it's divided by two. All right, does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Can you say what the formula was again? I didn't here, it's here. It's bonding minus anti-bonding divided by two. It's just, it's, just, it's this one right here. Okay. Okay, any other, any other questions? Any other questions? All right, I would, I'd recommend for some of you, it might not be a bad idea to, to watch, watch those um, molecular orbital videos again. Uh, there's there's three of them there. There's introduction one, and then it's one that shows you how to fill the electrons. And another one that has to do with, uh, I think, you know, the orbital shapes that we just talked about. So I, I would uh, I, I would strongly, strongly recommend uh, watching those videos to, uh, to, to improve your understanding of, of what's going on with this specific kind of question. And not just to try and memorize what the answers are. I don't think that's really the best, the best course of action here. All right. Any other any other questions here for this one? Okay. All right. I think now might be a good place. This might be a good place to leave leave it today. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to hang around, they certainly can, and I'll uh, see the rest of you on. Well, I'll see some of you. At twelve thirty, and yes, I'll see you on Wednesday. All right. See you. See you later. Thanks, Thanks Professor. Professor. Okay. Bye.